In this video, I'm going to review acute emergencies of the chest that you might see when you're either seeing patients in an emergency room or the radiologist reading images in an emergency room. And I'm just gonna jump now right into the first case. In this case is a middle-aged man presenting with acute tearing chest pain radiating to the back. For anyone that has seen an aortic dissection before, it's probably immediately obvious to you that that's what that is. And I'm gonna explain now some important things to look for in an aortic dissection. So to make the diagnosis, the first thing to just think about is that you're gonna see a dissection flap in the aorta. So that line here that is separating a more brighter area with a darker area. Here's the darker area here. That's our dissection and that's the flap separating these two sections. And what an aortic dissection is, it is a result of tearing of the intimal layer of the vessel and then blood leaks into this created space or false lumen that forms between the intima and the other layers of the aorta and it creates what we call a true lumen and a false lumen. The true lumen is the brighter one and in this case the true lumen is on the inside here and that's where the actual normal aorta is. Then we have the false lumen which is a little bit less bright and that's where the blood is leaking into. So this part here is the false lumen, what I've just outlined. So some important things to think about when you see an aortic dissection are is it type A or type B? And there are certain criteria for that. If the dissection flap begins proximal to the brachiocephalic origin, it's a type A, and a type B is anything distal. Type A is a surgical emergency. In this case, the dissection, we can already see it here. Here's the intimal flap here. So we have a false lumen. So this is a type A. So this is a surgical emergency. Cardiothoracic surgery needs to be called. Some things to think about then are, does the dissection flap involve the coronary arteries? Is it extending into the coronary arteries? So here's the origin here of the left main coronary artery. As you can see, there's a little bit of false lumen. This is the darker part, remember, is the false lumen. A little bit of false lumen involving that origin of the left main coronary artery. That's important because if the coronary artery arises entirely from the false lumen, you can have a myocardial infarct. That happens. And in this case, the right coronary artery, I'm going to point to here, right coronary artery, and watch as I scroll through. The thing I'm pointing at, watch as I scroll through. So that little vessel coming off is coming off the false lumen. So that is another important thing for the surgeon to know that the right coronary artery, again, it's right here, is coming off the false lumen. Another thing to think about is, has there been rupture into the mediastinum? Is there mediastinal hemorrhage? Well, in this case, we have this little outpouching here that I'm gonna point to right here. And what has happened is there is a contained rupture, something called a pseudoaneurysm arising from the false lumen. Again, here's that pseudoaneurysm here, and it's probably leaking because what we also have is mediastinal hemorrhage. And here's the mediastinal hemorrhage here surrounding the aorta, it's this area here. This is all hemorrhage. So this little pseudoaneurysm or contained rupture is probably leaking and there's mediastinal hemorrhage. If this gets bad enough, it can cause cardiac tamponade, which is something that's important to let the surgeon know about, of course. Cardiac tamponade is a clinical diagnosis. And then I'm now scrolling up and then back inferiorly. And as you can see, this false lumen extends into the abdominal aorta. And when you're reading one of these cases, another thing to think about is, are the main arteries that are arising from the abdominal aorta, are they arising from the true lumen or the false lumen? So in this case, here's our SMA here. That's coming from the true lumen. Remember the true lumen is brighter. So the SMA is coming from the true lumen and there it goes. So that's good. But let's look at the left renal artery. A component of it is coming from the false lumen. You can see the false lumen is the darker part and that false lumen is extending into that left renal artery. If this gets severe enough or stenosed enough, you can then have an infarct of the kidney. And actually, look at the way that the right kidney looks compared to the left kidney. This left kidney is probably infarcting related to this decreased blood flow because you have this false lumen feeding a lot of the left renal artery. And as a result, look how dark it is compared to this normally enhancing right kidney. That's because there's a left kidney infarct. Up more proximally, we have the celiac artery. Here's the origin of the celiac artery here, and this is arising from the true lumen. So that's my review of the aortic dissection and some quick bullet points of things to think about when you see one of these cases. So my next case is a middle-aged man with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coming with substernal pressure-like chest pain that is radiating to the left arm. You can probably tell by the history what I'm hinting at, and that is myocardial ischemia. And a lot of people don't think about this, but you can actually diagnose or at least suggest that there's an infarct in the heart based on the CT. And what I want you to do is look at the myocardium. So here is the left ventricle here. I'm just gonna circle it first. This is the left ventricle. That's a good place to look when you have a story that sounds like myocardial ischemia. And what I'm gonna now have you do is look at the myocardium. So this is myocardium here that I'm circling. And this is normal attenuating myocardium. So this is a normal density of the myocardium. I want you to compare that to this segment here. So when you have infarct, 
of the myocardium, you start to lose density or the myocardium starts to become hypoattenuating. In the chronic setting, it almost looks fatty, so it's very, very dark. But in acute myocardial ischemia, which is what this story sounds like, you'll see decreased density of the myocardium. And I want you to compare this myocardium to the one I pointed out earlier over here. It is darker, and that's because there is acute myocardial ischemia. And I actually had a case, I was working nights and had a case that I wondered, it looked a lot like this. It looked a little bit less dense towards the left ventricle apex. And I suggested to the ER doctor, they were thinking a pulmonary embolism or dissection. I suggested, what about myocardial ischemia? And sure enough, the patient had risk factors. They got a troponin and it was like a thousand. They took the patient to the cath lab and it was a STEMI. So you can definitely at least suggest myocardial ischemia from a CT. It's hard to make a definitive diagnosis for sure, but you can at least suggest it. So this is an acute myocardial infarct. Again, look for decreased density of the myocardium and you can always compare it to normal adjacent myocardium to get an idea. So for my next case, I have a middle-aged patient that is presenting with pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. And I'm going to start scrolling through, let you get an idea of what we're dealing with here. So I'm going to stop here at this image. And this is the pulmonary artery here. You have your branch into the right main, then the left main pulmonary arteries. And this decreased density, this hypodense structure, that is thrombus within the left main pulmonary artery. I'm going to scroll through it again to let you get an idea of how this looks. So this is what we call a saddle pulmonary embolus. This is something that can cause acute cardiac arrest, and it can cause patients to die very quickly. So this is an emergency. This is something to let the ER doctor know of immediately. And these days, interventional radiology can go in and take something like this out, potentially. You can also give TPA. So there are some options for treatment for this and there's a whole treatment algorithm and there's the whole massive versus submassive PE and if there's any sort of hemodynamic instability you're dealing with a massive PE and the treatment varies based on the classification and some of that is clinical some of that is imaging findings so there's a lot to it but in this case this is an emergency you want to let the doctor know ASAP when you see this and this is a saddle pulmonary embolus not that common usually when we do see PEs it's more distal like segmental or subsegmental pulmonary arteries so these more distal branches here in this case this pulmonary embolism is involving what we call the main left and right branches in the saddle configuration, but it's also involving the more distal arteries. You can see thrombus here on this side. This is thrombus here. Things to think about when you see a pulmonary embolism. The first thing is right heart strain. Things that can indicate right heart strain. First, you can measure the diameter of the main pulmonary artery. This one looks borderline and I can't actually measure it on this software, but you can measure that. If it's above three, then that's when you start talking about an enlarged pulmonary artery and potentially right heart strain. Although people can have chronically dilated pulmonary arteries as well if they have pulmonary hypertension and there are a bunch of different causes of that. If the right ventricle is too dilated and there are certain measurements you can do, this is the right ventricle here. It does look like it's at least as big as the left ventricle. So I would say there's probably some right heart strain. And given the amount of thrombus, that would not be unexpected whatsoever. So there's probably right heart strain. That right ventricle looks a little bit big. Another thing that can indicate right heart strain is if there is a reflux of this contrast. Here's the right atrium here. If contrast refluxes into the IVC, which you can see it adjacent to the liver here, here's a better view of it right here. If you see contrast in the IVC, that's another suggestion of right heart failure. Again, there are acute findings of that, like a saddle PE, but there are also chronic findings, so it can be a little bit difficult. Ultimately, these days, a lot of ER doctors are doing bedside echo, where they can look at the right ventricle and look at the heart in real time and see it contract and get an idea of right heart strain in that way, too. So this is a saddle pulmonary embolism, can't miss diagnosis, definitely an emergency. So the last case, this is a scout radiograph that I have pulled up here, and this is what we'll get when we're planning out a CT. You get a scout radiograph of the area you want to scan, and this is a normal right lung here. And then we're looking at the left lung here. Notice how loose it is in this area here. So that's because there is a collapsed lung or pneumothorax. Notice how you see normal pulmonary markings throughout the right lung. Then you just don't see those pulmonary markings out here. That's because there's a pneumothorax and this is the outline of the collapsed lung. You can see the lateral margin here and we're going to now look at it under CT. So I'm going to scroll through and let you get an idea of what we're looking at. So this is a large pneumothorax. This is all air within this space, the pleural space. This is the collapsed lung here, of course, and then this is a normal lung for comparison. This gives you a good idea, of course, what normal looks like, and then you have a grossly abnormal lung on the other side, so this is kind of nice. And when you see a pneumothorax this big, the next thing you want to think about is tension physiology and a potentially a tension pneumothorax, which is very much a clinical diagnosis, but you can suggest it as a radiologist if you see shift of the mediastinum to the other side away from the pneumothorax, and that's because all that air is filling up that space, and the filled up space then creates mass effect that pushes the mediastinum the contralateral direction from the side that has the pneumothorax. And I've actually now gone back to the scout radiograph where you can just look at it as if you're looking at the patient, and the mediastinum includes the heart, so it's all this. And you want to get an idea, is it shifted this way 
because of this big pneumothorax? And I would say probably yes. I mean, it's a big pneumothorax. It looks like it probably is shifted a little bit. You can at least suggest it and say that there is suggestion of mediastinal shift, you know, correlate for tension physiology, and the clinician can then go look at the patient, see their blood pressure, get a sense of how stable or unstable they are, and that'll guide management from there. But this, of course, would need decompression in a chest tube. Okay, those are my emergencies of the chest. Thanks for watching.